let's welcome Sarah up here. Sarah is um, an evol. I'm gonna have to read this because she's she is so amazing. <laughs> Sarah Cohen. She's an evolutionary ecologist, a marine biologist, and an environmental geneticist. Um, she teaches and carries out research uh, with her lab members at San Francisco State University, my alma mater, um, and at their marine field station, the Romberg Tiburon Center, which is just over the bridge there, a uh, wonderful place. Uh, and there she uh, takes advantage of remarkable natural and less than natural, you have to talk about that, I want to know what a less than natural site is surrounding, uh, the, uh, surrounding us on the outer coast and in the San Francisco Bay. So, Sarah, come on up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron, and thank you all for uh, sticking it out here for the biology side of this amazing uh, celebration of vanadium. Um, I think they're going to put the slides up, but I, I wanted to say uh, what an honor it is to get to talk in a chemistry series. Uh, I'm generally more on the biological side. I'm just going to go back here to the beginning of my slides real quick. Uh, one sec. Um, so thanks to, um, thanks to those of you in my lab as well for coming out tonight. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, here we go. So, um, so vanadium and tunicates, what is the deal? Why is there a marine organism that concentrates this rare metal, vanadium, to a million times the background concentration in seawater? What's the deal? So I'm going to cut to the punchline right away so you, don't, you aren't disappointed at the end. This is an I interactive program in that you get to solve the mystery because neither the chemist nor the biologist know uh, what vanadium is doing at all, and then what's it doing at these really high concentrations in tunicates. So what my goal is, is to tell you some amazing things about uh, the chemical wizardry of tunicates, but not necessarily about vanadium. And you're going to figure out from what you learned from Ron, how does vanadium fit into this picture? Okay, so anytime you figure it out, just shout it out, okay? <laughs> um, what I am going to do is introduce tunicates to you, first of all, because if you find vanadium to be rare, I bet you really also, let's just take a survey, who knows what a tunicate is? And if you're in my lab, you better raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so, so we have some important material to go over with that. Then we're going to talk about some amazing things that tunicates do, that perhaps vanadium could have something to do with it. Is that what you mean? I'm not sure what he's telling me to do. Don't yell. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. Okay, so fusion is one thing that we're going to talk about. Not nuclear fusion, but whole body fusion. So you can think about that. Fusing your body with your relatives, actually. And then invasions, invading uh, biological species, actually. So these are important issues for tunicates, so let's see what's going on with them. Um, you do note that I called them your talented relatives. Maybe you know that, some of you, that tunicates are your closest invertebrate relatives. What's an invertebrate? It, it doesn't have a backbone. So uh, most of the animals out there in the world are invertebrates, and you people are vertebrates. Uh, and tunicates are invertebrate chordates. They're not vertebrates, but they are chordates. So we call them urochordates or tunicates. So <laughs> here's some beautiful examples. They're uh, species that are local, actually. So most years you could see these in San Francisco Bay. Why not this year? Because tunicates are intolerant of low salinity. And if you heard a previous talk by Dr. Jean Larger in this, you know there's a lot of issues about salinity changes in the bay. This year our drought mercifully ended. A lot of rainwater, snow melt is coming into the bay. It has reduced the salinity to near zero earlier this year at our pier in Tiburon, and tunicates just don't put up with that. So right now, you'd need to go to Half Moon Bay, Bodega Bay, or some outer coast marina to see these guys. So we've got a tall, slender, clear uh, species called Siona in the middle with uh, two siphons that are sticking out. Uh, here's one siphon, and here's the other. And what tunicates are is a bag that filters seawater. Water goes in one end, goes through a filtration unit here, and goes out the other end. They when they're filtering, they're taking particles out of the water to eat. And there's a few other body parts that I'll show you later, but basically a big filtration unit with a stomach and gonads, and that's a tunicate. 
your closest invertebrate relatives. That's what they do. <laughs> but they're pretty, right? So this kind up here is called a colonial tunicate. And what that means is that you have the same filtration units as this solitary one here, but you've shrunken them down and put a lot of them under one covering. So you might be more used to the idea of corals, marine organisms that build reefs, the Great Barrier Reef, the reef in Belize, and they're repeated units with little polyps that capture food. And you could think of those as sea anemones, like you see in tide pools, all stuck together into a colony. And so it's the same deal with a solitary tunicate and a colonial tunicate. All right, let's look at this a little bit more. Because we want to think about flow. Where are they getting the vanadium from? They're getting it from the seawater. And so flow is what tunicates are all about, pulling in seawater, filtering it, taking out what they want, and expelling the rest. So this is a colony now, similar to the colony I showed you in the previous slide. And all these little openings here are mouths with little filtration units behind them that hook up inside, and then they expel the water out this one chimney. So that's a colonial tunicate. And so they're getting the vanadium, they're taking it in, they're filtering it, and then they're expelling water with much, much less vanadium. Why are they doing that? Uh, we don't know yet. But here's a little diagram that a fluid dynamicist, Steve Vogel, drew just to show the idea of what flow is going on. Let's look at that filtration unit for a minute. So here's water coming in. It's a bag, a perforated bag. It's gelatinous, it's soft. It has cilia all over all these surfaces and little perforations. Why would you have perforations in the bag? It's like a laundry basket. If you poured water through it, in the laundry basket, the plastic laundry basket with the holes all around it, had cilia beating to make the water flow into the basket and out of the basket. And then it had gummy goo, mucus, on the inside of the basket so that particles coming in because of the cilia drawing the current in, stick to the gummy goo. They stick to the gummy goo in this basket too, and then the cilia cause a current to go all towards one side where the mouth is. It takes this gummy, gooey, mucusy wad of particles, goes into the mouth, goes into the stomach, and out the intestine. That's what your closest invertebrate relative does all day long uh, on, uh, what we call fouling panels, for example. So this PVC plate was placed in Richmond Marina up in the North Bay uh, for two months, and it, is that it became covered with tunicates. These blobby things are solitary tunicates, and the colorful ones are these colonial ones. So there they are out there in the bay removing vanadium for you, or whatever reason. Um, so, so they have vanadium. They have a lot of things that remind us of being uh, chordate. And one of those is blood flow. So let's see if we can look at that here for a sec. This is, uh, so here you see, gosh. Here you see a lot of little channels, little highways, and the little particles in them are blood cells rushing quickly through um, through what we call the blood vascular system. Here is one of the little filter units out of focus. And here you see these little sausagey things. Those are the ends of the blood system. So lots of blood, lots of different kinds of blood cells, um, lots of materials moving through the blood system, including that vanadium. OK, here's just a diagram to show you uh, what we just saw in the movie. The blood system hooking up all the little filter units underneath uh, this shared, we call it a tunic, actually. And here's another weird chemistry thing you can think about even though you're not dealing with cellulose in this series, is that the covering on tunicates is made out of a chemical that's chemically indistinguishable at the molecular level from cellulose. So what other animal covers their body with cellulose? What other animal makes cellulose? Anybody know? Cellulose. Who makes cellulose? Trees, plants, exactly. Animals don't make cellulose. This animal is covered with cellulose. So that's a little chemical mystery for you. Does it have anything to do with vanadium? I don't know. Uh, let's look at this whole body picture now because I want you to see these bright orange orbs here. Those are babies. So the whole colony is uh, taking care of the little larval tunicates that are going to come out. 
What do the larvae look like when we stretch them out? Two of these things are larvae, and one is the graduate student, Benson Chow, who took these amazing pictures. So <laughs> he might forgive me for that. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so these are two different uh, genera, Diplosoma and Didemnum vexillum. They both live here on our coast. And you can see there's a head and there's a long tail. This is the deal with being a chordate. They have a chordate tail. They have what is this more or less a backbone, a notochord, what we've all got here, and we hope that our leaders develop more of, a backbone. <laughs> um, so that's the larva. This is the larva that turns into those filtering bags. How does that happen? They don't look anything like it, do they? And you're used to the idea of metamorphosis and radical metamorphosis from Insects. Everybody learns about insects metamorphosing. But lots of marine organisms do that too. Uh, I should have told you that these larvae are about a millimeter. And so there's one right there that swam out of this adult colony here. Damien Delton was a summer intern with us who captured that very cool picture of the larva coming out of the colony. And here's the head here blown up quite a bit. And these little prongs here, those are what the end of the blood system turns out to be. So I'm going to show you how that happens. But first I want you to see inside that yolky headed larva. This is your hint on how we're going to get from that larval tadpole form that looks like a frog larva sort of into a filtering bag. So look what's inside the yolky head, a little tiny filtering bag. It's almost like it's waiting to bust out. And that is the case. So they don't feed. Their little siphons are here that they're not open yet, so no vanadium concentration yet. There could be vanadium in the larvae provided by mom in all that yolk, and I'm not aware of anybody testing the larvae, so that would be very interesting to know. Because an idea about coloration in larvae in evolutionary ecology is that you show yourself off as that bright orange color to uh, warn predators not to eat you. And there is some data suggesting that, that the brighter the larva, the less fish go after it to eat. So perhaps with the color goes some chemical protection. In any case, here on the end then are those ends of the, that I called impuli, that are the ends of the blood system. So what happens when, uh, when the larva is swimming around and it's ready to metamorphose? Uh, first, I have to figure out how to click on this. Okay, so this is a movie by um, Dr. Billy, S ah, Dr. Billy Swalla. She's the director of Friday Harbor Marine Labs. I'm failing to do this properly. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, any minute there. So. Um, at Friday Harbor Marine Labs, they have a course that specializes in embryology, and they make amazing movies like this. So what happened to the tail just now? Where did it go? Do you still see the colored region in the end of the tail? It's disappearing into the head part of the larva. It's almost gone now. And we have what is the test, actually, left on the outside. We have the ampullae of the blood system spreading out and we have that area in the middle which indistinctly has the filter basket in the middle. And this is gonna keep going for a little while, uh, but what's gonna happen is that we've got a siphon forming here and a siphon forming here, and they're gonna bust out of the tunic and become a filtering, feeding vanadium collecting unit. So we're gonna move on now to watch this process from a different angle, which is that we're looking um, we're now looking from the bottom up as though this uh, larva was settling on a glass slide and we're looking up underneath it. Did it stop? Ah, excuse me. I'm not as adept at this as I might be. There we go, okay. So it's kind of like fireworks, right? Um, these are the blood system spreading out. And then here's our filtering unit. And there's actually little buds here because it's already starting to make the next filtering units even as it's spreading out and settling down. So now, hopefully, you realize that's your chordate relative. And it just kind of gave up the show of staying upright. Uh, and so here's a summary of the life cycle here. We've got an adult colony. They're called systems. 
It produces a larva. This is blown up a lot. That's a millimeter, remember? And this is more like a couple centimeters. It settles down. It splays out those blood vascular uh, ampullae, the ends, the sausages. It becomes a little filtering unit, and it starts adding more units. It buds them off. So that's growth here, asexual budding. It just keeps adding little units. So uh, just like up here where I told you there were buds coming, those are going to grow new colonial parts. But there's some other way that they can grow very, very quickly, and that's the fusion part. So two colonies can run into each other, and if they're very closely genetically related, they can fuse and form a chimeric individual. That is, a chimera is two different genotypes existing within one unified body. And here you can see that a dark red and an orange colony ran into each other. They were very closely related. They fused and they formed one body. Does that remind you of anything you know about in medicine, perhaps? It might remind you that um, if you need an organ donation, tissue donation, stem cell donation, you need it from someone very closely related to you. And so just like that kind of system in vertebrates, this is a blood-mediated, genetically determined recognition system. So that's the molecular wizardry I wanted to tell you about. They have an immune recognition system that's reminiscent of our own. And so this system has been widely studied by immunologists, including at Stanford, where they've pioneered the genetics of the system to use it as a model for understanding human immune recognition and transplantation and rejection. So this is the system in the wild, though, because we don't do this, do we? You've never fused with one of your offspring and stayed that way, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so, um, so that's what they do, though. The larvae might come out and just settle on its parent and fuse with it and become one body with two genotypes. And so here's an example I found in the Philippines, actually, where I could easily see in the wild a colony that's part red and part yellow. It's completely fused and interdigitated. It can't be separated. But you can see the individual filter units have melded together into one colony. And then here's an experimental plate that a student, Berta Colom, who came from Spain to work with us on the fusion genetics of these beautiful batrillids that live around here. And here we have a couple of fused colonies. So it happens in nature. It's similar to, uh, it's an immune recognition, a molecular, highly sophisticated molecular recognition symptom, uh, system. Uh, and in fact, marine organisms have been used for a long, long time in marine labs for studying processes of molecular recognition. So Eli Metchnikoff was an early winner of the Nobel Prize who worked at a marine lab on the Black Sea, and he did what seems like a strange thing now. He took little gelatinous sea urchin larvae and poked them with things, like a rose thorn, and then he watched the cells that aggregated around the rose thorn. And in this way, by careful observation and poking, he established the field of cellular immunology. Pretty crazy. Uh, so, um, what else do we use recognition systems for? Egg and sperm interactions have molecular recognition systems. And tunicates do this. So this is actually Siona, that clear slender tube I showed you, has a very complicated dual chromosome egg receptor, sperm receptor, molecular recognition system that prevents them from self-fertilizing too often. When I say it's a crazy molecular system, Actually, on one chromosome, the gene that controls the egg receptor is collinear with the sperm receptor, and they transcribe in opposite directions and come apart to form the different molecules. It's really quite complicated. Uh, and then one more molecular recognition system to remind you guys of our own adaptive vertebrate immunity. So we make antibodies. We can get vaccines that protect us from harmful uh, diseases like polio. And we are able to do that because of this molecular recognition system. This is the binding cleft in the major histocompatibility complex. Only vertebrates have this. Invertebrates do not. And so one reason that the researchers at Stanford and other places studied uh, batrillid tunicates, other kinds of tunicate recognition, is they want to find the molecular antecedents, the evolutionary antecedents to this amazing system. 
where hundreds of alleles are present in a population so that uh, you can recognize when um, a new pathogen arises. So, uh, so that system is in vertebrates, but it's not in invertebrates, and we don't know where it came from. Uh, more molecular mysteries. All right, so tunicate recognition genes in the blood determine fusion. Here's a bunch of colonies. They interact. If they're not going to fuse, what you see is the ends of the blood system and little um, clumps of deteriorating cells. They're attacking each other, killing each other, and they're going to form a border here, and fusion will not occur. On the other hand, if their blood uh, intermingles and they are highly related, then they form a chimera like this. This is one that Joseph Spaulding, another student in the lab, found in the wild here in the bay. Usually you don't get to see the fusion in process because the colors mix fairly quickly. All right, so why might you fuse? Why would you fuse with your close relatives? Well, obviously to help them out. So it's a it's an evolutionary phenomenon called kin recognition, and the idea is that you help things that you're most closely related to. And it's our idea of why naked mole rats, these other lovely chordates, uh, form eusocial cooperative communities, the same way that uh, insects do, some social insects do as well. So the idea is you fuse with close relatives because it's to your evolutionary advantage to help your relatives. And what do you get by fusing? You get a larger colony, you may be living on an ephemeral substrate like this kelp blade in Alaska uh, that Verena Wang collected. And this uh, colony that's bigger is in good shape to start reproducing early and often. And that's good because the kelp is going to slough off at the ends. There's a terminal uh, aspect to this substrate that's going to be hard on an animal living here. It wants to get big as fast as possible and reproduce as fast as possible. Same deal on our docks here. You can look off the sides of docks in Half Moon Bay or sometimes in San Francisco, and you can see that there's a lot, not a lot of extra space. Things are growing on top of other things. These are tunicates here, and they're going to run out of space on that muscle. So if they run into another colony and they fuse quickly, they can uh, reproduce faster. Similarly, at other times of the year, you could look on the pilings out here and see the same thing. All right, so what happens when they fuse? They run into each other, and if they're going to reject, like this one here, they form a stiff border. They don't grow into each other anymore, and there's cell death along the border. It's very stereotyped. Different species have different stereotype behaviors. Here's a series that Patrick Lee, another student, put together of two colonies over time running into each other. And this species, unlike that extensive cell death you saw in the other colonies, these just barely bump into each other, and then they part ways. It seems very civilized, doesn't it? So that barely uh, touching, leaking blood cells and moving on is a big contrast to this other species here, also common, where they bump into each other and then they just keep hammering each other with cells. It turns out that there's an evolutionary um, trend in this group where the more, um, Basal members, the ones who are uh, evolved first, uh, have extensive grappling and interaction. And the more derived members do this gentle bumping, say, eh, whatever, I'm not going to fuse with you, I'm out of here. So an evolutionary trend towards less intensive energetic interactions suggests that uh, this behavior of recognition and either fusion with your relatives or not, evolved from some other reason, perhaps gamete interaction, towards something to be used in space competition. So that was a story about fusion and allo recognition and chemical wizardry at a kind of basic level. How does immunity work in this chordate? Now I'm going to tell you about some of the implications of the system in an ecological sense. So here we're looking at some barnacles that are tucked away in the Philippines inside an envelope of a colonial tunicate. In this case, a didemnid colonial tunicate. Now, didemnid colonial tunicates are a bit infamous. And this is a, this is a very large infestation of them in New Zealand at a salmon net pen. And so you're looking at the nets of the salmon. 
You're actually hearing a scuba diver. You're not hearing tunicates breathing loudly. <laughs> um, but you can see that they have grown, you could say, completely out of control. Uh, so what is causing this sort of horrifying infestation? And what do we think about it? They're not native to New Zealand. They're invasive there from Japan. And so they're a problem for aquaculture. Uh, an even more dramatic problem is found here in the U.S. on George's Bank, uh, off the North, uh, North Atlantic coast. So this, unlike the net pen, which is an artificial human habitat, this is a natural habitat. It's a very rich fishing ground that um, has been exploited by uh, humans for hundreds of years. And it didn't used to be absolutely blanketed and carpeted by this tunicate, which actually is affectionately known as sea vomit now. Didemnum vexlum, or sea vomit. It's completely covering acres of the Gulf of Maine, prime fishing habitat. And so tunicates have earned a bad name for themselves, unfortunately. They foul net pens and uh, prevent uh, bivalve culture. And they are spreading, in this case, the dreaded sea vomit is spreading up the coast of um, North, uh, the North Pacific and into Alaska. So there's a lot of attention to taking care of them. And there's attention uh, for a particular reason to do with an interest in our own bays. So Mike Chin is a very kind fisherman who took this video in San Francisco Bay a couple years ago. And he was actually able to film herring spawning on the pilings uh, off of Ferry Point, which is kind of amazing. If you've looked in the water here, you know how uh, turbid it is. So this is unusually clear for San Francisco Bay. And he slowed down the video here so that you can see the herring moving very carefully and slowly against the piling. And what they're actually doing is the female herring are rubbing their uh, bottom of their bodies and releasing eggs on the side of the piling. So that's how herring spawn. They lay down a patch of eggs and then the males swim over and release sperm on top of the eggs. So this um, pattern of spawning is common among a variety of fish. It's called benthic spawning. And so what you get when that happens is here are some uh, pilings exposed at low tide, some concrete blocks up in Marin and they're covered with herring eggs. All of this is herring eggs, several inches thick. And that's what herring do. If it was any other kind of substrate besides concrete, they would still do that. In contrast, here are some cement blocks in Alaska in the infestation of the sea vomit tunicate we found, and it's covering the blocks. So the concern is, will the herring lay on those um, tunicates, on the sea vomit tunicate? So we put some PVC plates out on the seawall off of the marine lab in Tiburon. And we got tunicates to grow on them first, here and here. And then we put them out on the wall just before the herring spawn. So all of this is herring egg here, and all of this is herring egg here. And what you can see is that the herring eggs don't appear on the slick surface of this tunicate. That looks like a problem. In fact, people thought at first that was a chemical problem not necessarily vanadium, because these tunicates concentrate sulfuric acid in little bladder cells. And they thought the pH of the body was too low for the eggs to stick to. It turns out, though, you can see the eggs are sticking, aren't they? They're sticking to ridges and bumps. And so we thought we'd like to know what happens in nature, as opposed to on our PVC plates. So here in Alaska, you can see the uh, tunicate here in its drippy form, and you can see herring eggs developing or sticking to it all over the place. So that sounds pretty good. Looks like they won't be a problem for the herring. But what happens? The herring eggs are heavy, and they sink into the tunicate. These are eggs that are just several days old, and they sink into the tunicate. And then what happens? It looks a little like tapioca, doesn't it? So in the lab, we were able to show that those eggs that sink into the tunicate get smothered and die before they have a chance to hatch out. So unfortunately, this tunicate is bad news for herring spawning. And that's what's got people really worried about invasive tunicates, because uh, we don't know why they're spreading and covering acres. They're interfering with natural fishery processes. And more maybe than the unusual compounds in them, uh, just the sheer uh, presence of them there is a problem. 
Now, um, why are they spreading so extensively in unchecked? Why are they covering acres of an area where they didn't even used to occur and where there used to be a lot of predators? So that's your hint. The Gulf of Maine used to be full of codfish and lobster and sea urchins that probably would graze like things like this off. That's one idea of what, what might be going on. But another thought is that these animals confuse and grow very, very quickly when they are genetically similar. And it could be that that big patch in the Gulf of Maine is one giant clone or several clones of closely related individuals that have quickly fused and become a giant colony. We don't know if that's the case. And we wonder also what causes them to grow in these different forms. Uh, this, these two plates were right next to each other, grown off of uh, actually uh, County Park in Marin. And they seem to do something very different. Uh, so more mysteries of tunicates. Uh, vertebrates are finding them annoying. These are lovely little herring eggs that are not plagued by tunicates. So to bring it home to our side of the chordate realm, and to remind you that uh, here in our lovely bay, this is near our marine lab in Tiburon, we're trying to understand the mysteries of chemical recognition and chemical wizardry in tunicates. And we have a long, long way to go, as you can see. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I welcome you to contact me and my lab if you have some ideas about vanadium, other kinds of chemical wizardry, or you'd just like to see more tunicates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I would like to thank all of you for coming tonight to Everything Matters Tales from the Periodic Table. Our next periodic table element, chromium, will be in September. So we hope you'll be back for that, the 24th installment of Everything Matters. Um, and we hope you'll come back for Full Spectrum Science. I want to thank our crew for doing such an amazing job and getting this stuff out on the internet. And <laughs> awesome also providing music for it. So we hope if you have any questions, come on up and ask. Please feel free to come up and play with the uh, density uh, uh, demonstration here and hope to see you in September. Thank you. <laughs>